Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, continuing our study that, and, uh, that I've called a, a letter that changes lives. And uh, this is a letter that Paul wrote. Excuse me, this is a letter that Paul wrote. And this letter changes people's lives. And, uh, you know, we call this a letter. And uh, when, when we look at, at the Bible, we see this book, right? We, we see a book with pages and, and a cover. And, and before our Bible became what it is before us, it, especially where we're at now in the New Testament, uh, it was considered to be a, a collection of, of letters. And it's a letter that changed lives because this was a letter that was to point people uh, to Jesus. And, and think of the way that you get... I don't know, we don't necessarily get letters. Most of our stuff's emails and, and text messages, right? But, but when we pull those text messages up and those emails, we, we read those with some anticipation and uh, we, we come to those uh, a certain way. And a lot of times we'll put away other things to pick up a text message from somebody or an email or whatever. But back then, this was, this was the email or the text message given to these people. So when they received this, I believe they did similar to what we do. They put away other things. They put other things off to the side so they could take time to either read this letter or listen to someone read it to them. But we're going to be looking at uh, verse 19 through 26 and pick up where we uh, left off. Where we are told here, and we uh, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. See that phrase, we talked about that last week, being under the law. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore the deeds of the law, there shall, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed Uh, by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. The title of the message this morning is The Verdict of Humanity. The Verdict of Humanity. And when I say that, I hope it paints a picture, if you will, of a courtroom. I don't know how many in here have, have, have actually been to court. I think a lot of us have seen that kind of, kind of a pseudo court on, uh, on pe- people's court on TV, which is probably nothing like real court. It's a little bit dramatized. But you, you have a judge there. And you have two parties pre- presenting their case for whatever it is. It might be something silly. It might be something serious. And you hear arguments from both sides. And God is... Listen to arguments for mankind, but as we're going to see here, they don't they don't hold water because there is a verdict here of humanity. This is uh, in in some ways like a courtroom scene, uh, and, and as we're about to look at this morning, I'm giving some of this away, but I want to set a picture this morning that either you can try to represent yourself before God and try to hope that your good outweighs your bad. You can hope that. Uh, God's just going to, you know, go easy on you. You can hope that maybe uh, you did the right things at the right time in your life. Or you can simply plead the blood. You can simply claim the love of Jesus Christ. That song, Love Lifted Me. Uh, you, you, you have to go back to that. Your works don't lift you. Your good intentions don't lift you. They don't do anything for you, really. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things, but when we're looking at the scheme of things, when we're looking at your soul, your eternal soul that needs to be cared for, only the the love of Christ can.
can lift that up. And only the love of Christ can give you a new life, a new outlook, a new perspective. I can't give you a new perspective. I can try as much as I want. I cannot give you a new perspective. I have nothing to give you apart from the Word of God. But uh, let's pray and we'll continue on in looking at this verdict of humanity and, and really focusing this morning on taking sin seriously. Anything that, that, that misses the mark, we, we need to take that uh, seriously uh, this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. and. I ask that you would uh, take this time, take this message, use it for your glory and your honor. Help us to focus on you. Help us to do business with you today in a way where uh, we simply trust you and we simply turn to you. And, uh, and we don't play games with you this morning, that we uh, focus on your word. Help us to understand better what you'd have for us to do. Help us to uh, uh, be more like you through what's said and, and, and explained here today. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for our salvation this morning. Um, without that love, we're not lifted up at all. Thank you again. May you be honored and glorified in the remainder of our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Very few football coaches made a point against drugs as quite as effectively as a man named Eric Russell, you probably never heard of him. I never heard of him until I came across this. He was a coach for Georgia Southern College. He had arranged for some good old country boys to come in with a big rattlesnake and burst into one of their team meetings and throw this rattlesnake onto the floor. So the, the team's together and they're having this meeting. They're, they're discussing what gets discussed in these team meetings about game plans and so on. And, and these boys uh, came in and threw that rattlesnake on the ground. Everyone screamed and scattered. So after everything was over and the rattlesnake got out and the scare was over, uh, Coach Russell called his team together and he says, when cocaine enters into a room... You're not nearly as apt to leave as when that rattlesnake comes in, but they'll both kill you. A no trespassing sign was seen in West Texas and says, Stop. I know you're thinking about crossing this gate. What you should know is that if the coyotes, cactus, a mesquite, heat, dust, or rattlers don't get you, I will. I kind of want that trespassing sign. The point of those illustrations is that we see something like that and we either laugh or we take it seriously if if we were in those situations. But do we take sin seriously this morning? Do we take that that aspect of sin? Do we take that aspect of, of, of things seriously? Do we take it seriously about what God says who we are? And uh, we're going to look at three things this morning about this verdict of humanity. Do we take the verdict of humanity seriously this morning? Do we take seriously the fact that we have to depend on God? Do we take it seriously that we can't earn our way into heaven? Do we take it seriously that we have to depend on Him to sustain us this morning? The first thing, and I'm going to be very quick with this one because everything the last probably three or four weeks is actually built up to this, but we see in verses 19 and 20 the condemnation of the law. Number one, we see the condemnation of the law. Look at verse 19 with me. Now we know that what things uh, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. Remember I talked about earlier the, the law being under the law. That, that's, that's the idea of being enslaved to it and, and being in bondage to it. Because if you don't trust Jesus Christ, you have to trust your ability to keep that law, which we can't do. But he goes on here to say that every mouth may be stopped. Basically, you think you can justify things with God? You think you can explain how good of a person you are? Every mouth is going to be stopped. We live in a world today where if somebody has a thought, it just somehow seeps out into society, does it not? You know, if somebody has a thought, and I know some of you are thinking right now who I'm thinking about, it, it, there's an individual that has a thought, it makes it on a Twitter feed. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. If a radical person on, on, on one side of an issue or the other has a thought, it seems to make it out there into Twitter land and Facebook land, and it hits the news, and people pick it apart and analyze it, criticize it, and critique it for about two to three days for some news ratings. 
But there's going to come a time where every mouth's going to be stopped. People aren't going to be able to just go on Twitter and say this, that, and the other for various reasons. But every mouth is going to be stopped. But he goes on to say here that all the world may become guilty before God. Boy, this is, this is kind of grim, is it not? This is kind of a grim feeling. But in verse 20 he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law, sin is the knowledge, or therefore, excuse me, for by the law, sin is, sin, the law is the knowledge of sin, excuse me. So he's saying here, the deeds of the flesh, or deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight. We're not going to be justified on our own. We're, not going, to, we're going to fall short. The law cannot save us. But God revealed a righteousness that could save us. Apart from the law is where that righteousness is. That is the essence of God's plan for salvation in Jesus Christ. I'm going to move on here in just a moment. But friends, we need to remember that there's, there, there's a condemnation that, that exists. And once again... Where's, where's our faith at? Where is our dependence at? Is our dependence in, in, in Jesus to take that away? Or are we just going to keep trying to work harder? Be like that. I've used this illustration a couple times now. That team is down 50 to nothing at halftime. And the coach just says, guys, just get out there. Just play better. I know you're down 50 to nothing. I, 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 I know you've thrown 10 interceptions. I know you can't tackle anybody and you can't block anybody. But just get out there and just play better. Don't worry about the game plan. Don't change the game plan. Just go out there and play better. We would say that that coach has lost it. But if we leave here today without a, a, a faith, without a, a time in our lives where we have placed faith in Jesus Christ for the salvation from our sins, we're doing the same thing. There, there, there must have been a time where we've called on Him for salvation. There must have been a time where we realized we were a sinner that deserved hell. We were somebody that was on that path of destruction. And we called out to Him. And listen, there's not magic words to do it. Simply acknowledging that you're a sinner. Acknowledging that He is the Savior. And believing on Him. Calling out to Him to save you this morning. I hope that you've done that. I hope you don't leave here today having never done that. And never done that with your heart. And not just trusting in an experience or just trusting in a prayer somewhere. But, but really knowing that you, you had a change of belief in your heart. Otherwise you're condemned by the law. We see secondly, I told you I was going to go through that, that pretty fast. The compensation of the Lord. The compensation of the Lord. Usually when there's a verdict that gets passed... There's a fine to pay or some sort of restitution that's made. But we see here the compensation of the Lord. Look at verse 21. But now, you know, when you hear but, what does that usually mean? It usually means it cancels out everything before it, right? But now, in verse 20, 21, excuse me. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God which is by faith, by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. We, we've tried to hit on this so many times in the last couple of weeks, that there is no difference. There isn't a, a group of people that God's going to say, well, you know, you guys kind of had it hard, or I kind of like how you look better, so I'm going to... He doesn't do that. There is no difference. The, the, the person that robbed a bank is in the same need of the same grace and the same Savior as someone that all they did was steal a candy bar from Dollar General. Or just, you know, worst thing they did is burp at the dinner table. Let's read on. Verse 23. This is, this is a, a verse many of us know, frontwards and backwards. For all have sinned. Try preaching that to somebody. I'm a pretty good person. For all of us, well, that hurts my self-esteem. Sometimes we need our self-esteem to be hurt a little bit so that we can have a dependence on Jesus. I'm not saying, oh, I'm lower than a worm. That's not healthy either. But when we realize for all of sin, we have to, we have to acknowledge truth above feelings, ladies and gentlemen. What if I just don't feel like going 55 out here on, on 39? I feel like going 80. I feel like going 80. 
I don't feel like going 55. I feel like going 80. I'm probably going to hurt somebody else or myself in the process. But let's read on here. We're all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, he opens the book here and says, A servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God here in verse 21 refers to God's method of bringing people into a right relationship with Himself. His method is without the law. You know, when Peter, and he opened his, his letter, he didn't talk about the law. He talked about how he had something in common with other believers, and that what he had in common was Jesus Christ, that he, that he called like precious faith, meaning that Peter himself had to recognize he was a sinner. He had to trust in that truth. He had to trust in that truth that Jesus saved him, and he, and he did, and he had to rely on that. John Gill tells us, for the law discovers sin, but not a righteous, but not a righteousness which justifies from sin. It shows what righteousness is, but it does not direct the sinner where there is one to be had that will make him righteous in the sight of God. Meaning that the law, all the law really does is show you that you're a sinner. You need Jesus Christ. Paul didn't invent what was going on. It was predicted long ago, as the phrase in verse 21 tells us, it is witnessed by both the Old Testament and or the law and the prophets, excuse me. So the Old Testament said that the righteousness, this righteousness we're talking about, it was coming. It was coming through Jesus Christ. Luke 24, 44 through 45 tells us, And he said unto them, There are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And listen to what he says after this. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. We need to understand the Scriptures. This is part of why we need to be in church. This is part of why we need to uh, be in the Word ourselves. We need to understand the Scriptures. What good is something if you can't understand it? What good is it to just read it if you can't understand it? Now that doesn't mean you just look for something you can't understand. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here this morning. But you need understanding. That's going to take time. It's, th- this, is, this is not a comic book. This isn't Reader's Digest. This isn't the uh, 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 Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, this is God's Word. And uh, uh, it takes time sometimes. And it takes a dependence on Him to understand things in the Bible. And you're not going to understand everything on this side of heaven. Acts 28 and verse 23 says, And when they had pointed unto Him a day, there came many to Him unto His lodging, whom He expounded, and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus. And listen to what it says here, how how he preached here. It says, both from the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And listen to how long this meeting ran in this verse. From morning till evening. I worry about upsetting somebody if I preach longer than 35 minutes. I preached 40 last week. I think that's about a record for what I've preached here as pastor. They went from morning to evening. You think an hour long revival meeting is rough? They went from morning till evening here. Going over the law, understanding it, seeing how Jesus Christ was revealed uh, in, in those pictures in the Old Testament. God's righteousness can now be man's possession and begins to influence his life. How? By faith in Jesus Christ, meaning you have to trust in Him. You trust in Him for salvation, but that's not where it ends. That isn't where it ends. You know, I used to think when I hit 18, I would never have to face peer pressure again in my life. Well, not so. Then I graduate college. There's a diploma on the other side of that platform. I go walk across that and get it. Of course, it's not the, the real thing. It's just a, they give you the thing it goes in. Then you, you know, get it when your bill's settled and you got your academic work completed and whatnot. 
And I thought, boy, I got this. I'm, I'm not going to have. I'm not going to have near as many problems now. I made it. No. You have to depend on Jesus. Sometimes day by day. Well, you have to obviously day by day. But sometimes moment by moment with what you're experiencing. Sometimes you have to trust Him and you don't understand what's going on. There's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles concerning their being under sin. Back in verse uh, 9, we talked about that last week. In the same way, there is no distinction under the manner by which Jews and Gentiles obtain salvation. Verse 22 tells us it is by faith. Romans 10.12 tells us, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Acts 15 and verse 9 says, It put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. When we trust Him by faith, He purifies our hearts. When we trust in His ways, when we trust in His words, it purifies our hearts. What does purified water do? What, what does that process do? It takes impurities out. When water, you want to drink purified water, right? When you see that label on that bottle of purified water, you don't worry about it. It's clear. It's, it's been purified. You have no worries or concerns, right? But if I give you a glass of tap water, and, and, and it's maybe got something, just a little grain floating in it, a little grain that you somehow spot. In your mind, you think, boy, this isn't purified water. Would you drink it? Probably not. Maybe if you were super thirsty, but you would not want to. You would rather have that purified water, right? And that's a process that has to go through our hearts. Listen to me carefully. Our hearts have to be purified. And that only comes by trusting in His way. Trusting in Jesus, believing by faith in how He wants us to conduct ourselves. Verse 23 explains how deprived of a people we really are. This explains how we fail to obtain salvation, how destitute we are. The glory of God refers to the outward manifestation of what God is. We fall short of the glory of God, meaning we fall short on our own of being like Him. On our own, we fall short of loving people. On our own, we fall short of serving Him. On our own, we fall flat on our face. I don't know about anybody else here, but I, I'm, I don't like to fail. I'm, I, have a, I have a fear of failure. Warren Worsby says that God declared everyone guilty so that He might offer everyone His free gift of salvation. See, we're seeing some good news now here in Romans 3. But we had to see the bad news first. We had to see that in order to understand how we could obtain the righteousness of God and how we could be more like Him and how we might be saved and how our hearts can be changed. We see thirdly and lastly the cancellation now of the debt. The cancellation of the debt. I think it's clear to see up to this point there's a debt that's here. We fall short of the glory of God. Much like what happens if a company, a business, a government, a family, they fall short if they spend too much money, they don't meet their budget, they fall short of budget, right? So there's a, there's a debt that's there. And we see here a cancellation of that debt. Starting in verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a, a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus." Justification describes a person's status in sight of the law, not the condition of his or her character. We must not confuse justification and sanctification. Sanctification is the process whereby God makes a believer more like Jesus. Salvation is free to all, ladies and gentlemen, but it is not cheap. Three words describe 
for us what God did for our salvation. Redemption, propitiation, and the blood. I'm going to talk about those uh, quickly this morning. Redemption. This is the idea that Jesus bought us, therefore we belong to Him. It conveys the idea of buying back something. It involves a cost. Jesus didn't just pay, excuse me, God through Jesus didn't just pay pocket change for us today. We aren't the price of you know, some junk in an antique store. Jesus gave His life and shed His blood. Now, I'm not putting down antique stores, okay? I, I, I like going through there and, and looking at stuff too, but the, the cost in comparison, there is no comparison. Jesus laid down His life. He shed His blood. Who else would do that for you? Who else would do that for me? When, when we deserve that penalty, we deserve that death on the cross, we deserve that punishment. Titus 2, 13-14 says, Looking for that blessed hope at the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people. We're supposed to be peculiar people. Zealous of good works. You've been bought with a price. So many times I see people wanting to just be their own person. I want to be my own person. I want to be free. I want to do what I want to do. Well, we live in a society that allows you an, an immense amount of freedom to a degree. However, freedom isn't free. We've heard that before when it comes to the patriotism of our country. Salvation's available, but it wasn't free. It's free to you and I, but it costed God His own Son. Salvation doesn't cost you or I anything. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to remember when we're thanking Him for our salvation that, that He instituted a plan and He paid a cost that, that you and I should have been charged that. I've used this illustration several times and we use it again. If you go to court for a speeding ticket, all the evidence is stacked against you and somebody comes and wants to not only pay that ticket but have that ticket put against their record, their driving record. Well, we, we would love that person. We would feel somewhat indebted to them. The next word is propitiation. We don't, that's not a word we use. We don't go around talking about propitiations, right? We don't, we don't, go, to the, we don't go up here to Backwoods at, at breakfast time and say, you know what, I think that we are going to talk about propitiation today and uh, how that plays out in our lives. No one says that. Okay, that, that, that's a word we don't use today, but it's an important word for us to understand. 1 John 2, 2 says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I want to stop and say something about that for a minute. There are people that have access to God today and don't even realize it. If Bill Gates, who's considered one of the richest people ever, were to come here to South Greenfield and put up a sign that said, I'm giving everybody $100, all you got to do is show up. There's people that would show up. There are also people that would say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't like him, I don't need his money, or I, don't, I think that's a scam. You have those responses to the gospel. There, there's people that say, boy, I never with my heart truly believed that Christ saved me. I need to call out to Him for salvation. There are some people that say, I don't need it. Not for me. Or there's some people that say, I don't believe a word of that book. It's sad. 1 John 4.10 Something else about propitiation. Herein is love. Herein is love, he says. And, and if you, you've been here for the last few years, you know we went through 1 John 4 a long time ago. Not that we loved God. Our love doesn't compare to the love that He showed us, because it says, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. That is the wrath-bearing sacrifice for us. The Greek word for propitiation is also used in the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament for mercy seat. That is the lid that covered the Ark of the Covenant in which the sacrificial blood was sprinkled for the atonement of sin. See how that ties together? There's always, from the beginning... 
been steps in place that point to Jesus Christ. And then we see the third word, blood. The word blood tells us what the price was. Jesus had to die on the cross in order to satisfy the law and justify us, to give us a right standing with God. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why if somebody loses too much blood, they don't have life, right? They, they, pass, they pass away. They don't survive. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. All the way back in the Old Testament, we see that blood had, had to be the, the payment to satisfy here. God demonstrates His righteousness by showing that God is both just in His dealings with sin and the justifier who provides the righteous standing for the sinner. Note that it is only those who have faith in Jesus who stand justified. But only God could find a way to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is why God's not just going to let somebody off the hook. If He let somebody off the hook, He'd be a corrupt judge. But if He said, I'm, I'm sending you to hell, there's nothing you can do about it, there's no provision for you, where, where would the grace and the mercy and love be, right? But God has a way to both be just and the justifier. The weakness of the Levitical law is further typified as we see it in contrast to the sacrificial work of Christ. The work of the priest was daily. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial work of Christ is eternal. The priests were continually standing, meaning that their work was never completed. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, meaning that His work is done. The priest had to offer up sacrifices that had no power to remove sin. The sacrifice of Christ removes sin. We see that word remission. You know, I, whenever I read that in Scripture, immediately my mind thinks of people that have had cancer and then there's been a remission there, meaning it's taken away. Uh, there's no sign of it on, on any tests. Our sin's taken away. The sacrifice of Christ removes sin and its consequent guilt forever. The offerings of the priest only reminded the people of their never-ending sinfulness and guilt. The sacrifice of Christ removes the guilt as the worshiper experiences for the first time true freedom from sin. So in other words, when, when we sing about the cross, we sing songs like Love Lifted Me, we shouldn't feel guilt. We, we should feel freedom. We should feel a, a, a gladness in our heart that God's love lifted us out of the depths of sin. Now under the Old Testament law, when that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, when that lamb was slain in the Old Testament, it was just a reminder. Because Christ hadn't came yet. But today we can look at a cross and we see life. And the, in the Old Testament, prior to the crucifixion of Christ, a cross, like these two here, it was a symbol of death. People wear crosses as a necklace now. Because it, it's a sign of life. And we should, we should look at that and it should be a sign of life, not death. The justifier, God, the Father, unveiled the only means of, of redemption excuse me, and justification. That is through Jesus Christ alone. God required a sacrifice and gave that sacrifice to mankind. In closing, during the Spanish-American War, during the Spanish-American War, Clara Barton was overseeing the work of the Red Cross in Cuba. One day, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, who later became president, came to her, and he wanted to buy food for the sick and wounded Rough Riders. That was the soldiers. But she refused to sell him anything. Roosevelt was perplexed. His men needed the help. They needed these supplies. He was prepared to pay out of his own personal funds to get these supplies. When he asked someone why he couldn't just simply pay for the supplies, he was told, Colonel, just ask for it. And a smile broke over Roosevelt's face. Now he understood these provisions were not for sale. All he had to do was simply ask, and they would be given freely. Truth here that the plan of salvation is absolutely free. 
Salvation is free to you and I, but it's still costed. Today, as a, as a believer, the grace and mercy, it's there, but friends, we've, we've got to ask for it. We've, and in our asking for it, we've got to depend on God to bring it. You may be at a point in your life today where you, you need some mercy, you need some grace. Come to Him in prayer about your situation. Maybe you're here and, and you've never had that true repentance in your heart to God for salvation. Maybe you just said a prayer or whatever the case may have been. It may have been just an experience, but there wasn't, it wasn't with the heart. Because you, you, can, you can say things and not mean it from your heart. You've got to mean it from your heart. You've got to have a relationship with Him. And I hope that today, this verdict of humanity that we've looked at, starting out very grim, that you see that you have hope, the hope's not in a church. It's not in me. It's in, it's in the Lord. It's in Jesus. That's where your hope's at today. Let's pray.